just wait for the man to flick the switch. So thank you very much uh, for being with me. I'm not going to ask how you are because um, it's that critical moment halfway between coffee uh, or between this and coffee. Um, my name is Ewan McIntosh, currently working with Channel 4 Television uh, with their 4IP fund, looking at innovating uh, public service broadcasting by not doing anything to do with the television, which is an interesting challenge. But for me, um, the handheld conference presents a big challenge because I am not a handheld aficionado. Um, frankly, I don't care whether what I'm getting is through a handheld device, a lap-held device, if there's such a thing, or a desk-held device. What I want is my stuff. I think most people want their stuff. And whatever device it comes through is neither here nor there, um, as long as you get it at some point, and the sooner the better. But bearing that in mind, I'm going to go through five points. This will be the first one, as you can see. Um, what I find interesting about the 21st century learning question, can you imagine an examination where it took you nine years, nearly, to work out what the question meant before setting around and getting an answer out? Because that's what we do with 21st century learning. We're nine years in, and it's really only in the last two years we've started asking that question. Now, the seminar uh, this afternoon was entitled Pedagogy versus Technology, which is a weird, simplistic way of putting forward the debate about 21st century learning. But there's a little hint of something in there. The technology does change the way we think about learning. So while it may not lead learning, it certainly gives it a jolly good kick in the backside. So let's take a look at five points. We might not get through them all. We'll see how we go. The first point is to do with that question. If you know me, you've probably had this one shoved down your throat already. Any ideas what it is? Don't tweet it, actually speak. That would be nice. A little bit of uh, you know, audience participation. Shout it out if you know what that is. Have a guess. Please me. Huh? Snow. Snow. That's some pollution you've got where you live. No? It's not that. Nothing to do with television either. Any better? Phone. See again? Phone. It is. It's phones. Well done. It's um, 426,000 phones, the number that the Americans throw away every day. Yay! Yay. <laughs> yeah. Who cares about the environment? Let's throw away the phones. But the reason they're throwing away is quite profound. They're throwing them away because they need or want the latest one, the one that does all the stuff, the one that does what their Mac used to do so that when they're out, they can use it. How many people do you know that still own the first generation iPhone? A couple of you do. See, insurance companies found that lots of people lost them this summer. <laughs> and they need genuine fact and needed them replaced. And there's a reason for that. You don't want an old iPhone that works at half the speed of the new one. So you go and buy. You lose the old one and you go and buy a new one with your ill-gotten gains. There are three and a half billion mobile phone users around the world. There's only a billion people using the web through a computer. But the three and a half billion people, many of them, are beginning to use the internet. Nearly all of them will be using mobile phone services that come through IP, that come through internet protocol. And 60% of that is in developing countries. It's not in the UK, it's not in America or Canada or Australia or New Zealand. It's in developing countries, especially China and India. A quarter of that growth is found there. And the thing that mobile phones allow us to have is shared awareness, a shared understanding of, um, of what's going on at any one time. I'm going to go into that point in a second, but I want you just to bear with me. The thing about mobile phones and handheld devices and PDAs is that when I go around and look at how people are promoting them and using them, for me, it's kind of, they're using it for what I call the practices, as in, you would take the thing and you would do the most obvious thing with it. It's relatively easy. You buy the kit, you put it in the classroom, you adjust your pedagogy slightly, you do a project, and we were doing handheld learning. Wonderful. But I'm going to use an example that's nothing to do with technology. We don't see the obvious sometimes when it's staring us in the face. Astronomers, has anyone ever noticed these are called them antigrams, as in they present the opposite of what's actually in the world? Anyone ever spotted that astronomers, when you rearrange the letters, is no more stars? Honestly, on the sly. Silent, listen. Commendation, aim to condemn. Antagonists, I'm not always against. And this one's my favorite. Elvis lives. <laughs> so words you use every day and you don't realize that hidden in there is the opposite of what you were actually meaning to say. Now, the point behind that is that with cell phones, we tend to poo-poo 
the less obvious uses. For example, there are only 80,000 people in the UK using Twitter. Tiny, tiny fraction of people use Twitter, which is a mobile phone um, uh, mini blogging service. But Twitter allows people to have a shared understanding of things that are going on in the same space, even if they don't know each other. So for example, um, let me show you. Sunday night, um, I was in an area of town I didn't know, and I wanted to um, find a place to eat. So I put out my Twitter message, I've been putting a few of these out, and um, all my Twitter messages, these little tiny messages here, go straight to my Facebook account. And one of the things that I noticed is that when I put it out, normally my Facebook account ends up having the good advice. So I put, anyone recommend a nice, not too expensive restaurant in Pimlico? Apparently that's quite hard to do um, in Pimlico. And this one here sprung out it's from a high school friend who I think I've talked to maybe three times in the last 10 years. Our paths have gone very different ways, but we're Facebook friends with a capital F. And she said, why not try our restaurant in Fox Draw Oscar on Royal Hospital Road? You can see the menu on the website, gordonramsay.com. She's the COO for Gordon Ramsay. Um, a useful friend to have on Facebook, it turns out, when you're looking for a place to eat. So I ended up going there and having an absolute ball, absolutely wonderful place. So that allowed quite a lot of people to have a shared awareness of the fact I'm looking for a restaurant. But it also meant that James, who actually lives um, in London, didn't know the restaurant. So he's discovered a new restaurant he can go to. Now restaurants are facile, not too important examples. But can you imagine learning where every kid in the class actually understood why they were there and what they were doing? Wouldn't that be nice? instead of having very different understandings of what it is they're doing there and, uh, and, and why that's going on. I put a little message out earlier on, just as we got started, as Stephen was going, and asked people just to tell me, where are you, what's the weather, and what's the drink you're holding? Um, three things very important to my heart. And so if we go down here, we can see people in this building who are downstairs in the Queen's Vault, dry but cool with the aircon. I can see people who are in uh, Wiscasset in Maine, I've got folk uh, in Edinburgh, where it's mild, drinking Barry's tea. People in Glasgow, where it's overcast, no surprise there. Um, North Carolina, Stratford-upon-Avon. So you've got people from large geographical areas, from uh, America, from the UK, from wherever. I've got questions. So Pets Valdo, whoever that is, is saying, hi, Stephen, this is to you. Uh, could you expand on what you think will become of teachers after the death of education, dawn of learning? So somebody who's not quite picked up on the point wants to go into it in greater detail. But the only reason all these people are drawn together is because we have a shared awareness of what's going on in this room. Put your hand up if you responded to that and you're actually in this room. One person. So there's a lot more people in this room than you can actually see, which terrifies me. But it's quite fascinating. You can use it as well to find out what's going on. So when friends and colleagues tell me that there's a blast 20 feet behind them, you suddenly start wondering what's going on. You realize it's in Jaipur, and that was one of the nine bombs going off in Jaipur earlier in the year. When earthquakes happen in San Francisco, I find myself calling my friends to check they're okay before the earthquake's even over. I'm sharing the experience with them. Now, mobile allows us to do that, but online, traditional websites, whether they're accessed through a computer like this or whether they're accessed through a mobile phone are ultimately where all the work is taking place, if you like, and the two are connected. I'm going to take a look at one, uh, I'm going to actually, I'm going to zip over past the example. You can go and read my blog post for the example um, and work out where that haze was. But shared awareness is not just about technology, it's also about having the desire and the platform on which to feel you can share what you believe. So this morning, a lot of you were frankly pissed off with some of the keynote stuff that was going on. You were whispering to each other, but you weren't putting pen to Nintendo to tell us. Why? Because you fear that that's not the platform to do that on. Others of you were raving and not telling anyone else about it, which is there's maybe not a shared platform here yet, although I think that by the end of today and towards tomorrow, that platform will evolve and become much more solid. The second point, it's all down to participation culture, and the second word is vital. That this is not a switch. It's a bit like what Laurie was saying this morning in terms of learning and evolving learning taking a lot of time. Of course, it's kind of a truism, but participation culture can happen in quite short bursts. I Love Bees is a lovely example in the form of an alternate reality game that relied on the web 
on an underlying storyline as well as on mobile phones and, and telephone calls uh, in order to work. It was a promotion for the game Halo. And the best thing I can do is just let you watch a minute or so of video and um, you'll get a picture for that. Can we turn the volume Since off the computer? You have a bogey right in up. Quarter on the other side of that door. Proceed with caution. Whoa, 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 whoa. She disappeared. What do you mean disappeared? I mean she's gone. No trace. Wait a second. There she is again. What? Oh, How oh, the oh, hell? Oh, my God. What? She hid on the ceiling. What the hell? It all started in mid-July when a mysterious package was sent out, a jar of honey containing nine letters that, when arranged properly, spelled out, I love bees. But on July 16th, the day when a theatrical trailer for the upcoming Halo 2 was launched nationwide, the pieces fell into place. At the end of the trailer, a quick flash of ilovebees.com sent Xbox fans sprinting for their PCs. At first glance, the website appeared to be nothing more than an amateur beekeeper's website that had been hacked. But a closer look only resulted in more confusion. What exactly was going to happen when the counter reached zero? It's early in the morning on August 24th. Uh, ILoveBees.com is just updated with a list of over 200 sites. Uh, they gave GPS, longitude and latitude, and now it's up to us to get to one of these sites to answer what is apparently going to be a payphone, give it a code word and a nickname, and all of a sudden that will unlock an axon. Once all these axons are activated online, it unlocks a hidden message. So far it's been WAV files with gibberish or background story, we think, for Halo 2. Jen, I've got the pass box over here. Coming. We have arrived at a bank of payphones here on 2nd and Colorado. We're waiting for a phone call which should come in, well, within any minute now. So let's, uh, let's go meet the people standing by. So far, the phrases seem to be pulled from the bits of dialogue. Once all of these dialogues are known, they can be rejumbled into the correct order to, you know, present a story. Crew member, what is my nickname? Operator. Alec with the Berkeley crew. Lieutenant Watson. Lieutenant John the Man. Lieutenant Mr. Bojangle. Soldier, what kind of special skill do you offer my crew? I play guitar. Where is your guitar? In the trunk of my car. Put the phone down and go get your guitar. Yes, ma'am. Run. Okay, so they're quite serious about what they do. And this is a game. Now, the way it worked was using a combination of cell phones and pay phones in different locations. And every time a, self, uh, a pay phone went, they were given a piece of information and they had to give a piece of information back. And they had to somehow let the next person in the chain know what that personal information was. So when their call box went off, they were able to answer the next clue and so on and so forth. They did this a second time around in this game with 2,000 people. And the, last, the difference in time between the last two calls was just 15 seconds and the participants were nearly 400 miles apart and they didn't know each other. And they were using handheld technology to be mobile and to be able to go around and solve the puzzle that was being presented to them. Now these alternate reality games, they're very complex. You need two minutes of video to explain just the beginning of what that's about. But the depth that is offered in that game is what's so tantalizing for the people taking part in it. And sometimes we run, we run away from stuff that's complex. The complexity of this is too complex to fit within a curriculum or to fit within a nice 45 minute lesson plan in secondary school. So the challenge here is to make sure that we're not doing interesting stuff like this just in primary school and elementary, but that we take some risks and put that throughout schooling. Not saying that we should all do alternate reality games, but the complexity and the fact this game takes place all over and not just in one institution is what's interesting. The second thing that's interesting is that another game like, uh, like uh, World Without Oil, where um, the game was, what would you do if gas prices rose above $4 a gallon? And this is two years ago when that was just unimaginable. People played that game. They created reportage describing what they were doing, how they were saving electricity, how they were saving power, how they were saving fuel. And now that's become a resource for people in North America trying to work out how the hell you do survive when gas goes over $4 a gallon. So games can become useful tools later on as well. They degrade quite nicely into the web. And of course, you can take part now in more volunteering computing. Now here's the challenge to quite a lot of handheld learning as it stands. We couldn't fit a presentation onto Stephen's laptop because it was running out of memory. That's a 2,000 pound laptop. My laptops run out of memory fast, and it's about two grand as well. 
My mobile phone cannot cope with all the information that eventually, when they get the thing working again, is going to come out of the hydron thingy, bob bob. But this is what they need. They need your home computing power to cope with all the information that's coming out of that project. They don't necessarily need your mobile devices. So that's why I'm keen to use the device for the job that suits. Um, and participation culture really requires that mixed media approach. The third, fourth, and fifth points I'm going to rattle through. But the first one, this is from my colleague Matt Locke at Channel 4 Education, who is floating around somewhere. And it's a really nice way to start thinking about where the technology might fit and how it might affect technology, uh, how it affect pedagogy. The first one is our use of secret spaces. How much do we actually make use of mobile SMS messaging, instant messenger? Then how do we use the groups that Dana was talking about this morning, the group spaces that depend on the ecosystem of the group in order to survive and thrive? How do we use those in our learning spaces? Publishing spaces where we fling stuff out. I have a blog where I fling things out there and some people like it and other people really don't. But at least there's a place for you there to feed back on. Publishing spaces where I don't know who the audience is unless they leave a comment and talk about it. Performing spaces where we can be people we're not. We can attempt things that are impossible in the real world. Where we can become confident where we're shy or where we can try other things out. Participation spaces, a bit like this except this isn't a participation space. Unfortunately, this is more a watching space. You're sitting there taking all this in and the discussion, the participation will come later. But in a classroom, is there a way for us to start using all six spaces within the one environment? The fourth point I'd like to bring is in relation to pure pedagogy. In America, I don't know whether they're doing this in New York City now, but they were going to offer $500 to every student for their good grades. And parents hated the idea. They're meant to be doing well in school. Why would you give them $500? So here's a question. How often can we encourage our students? And the simple answer is not very often before it becomes faded and tired and all the rest. You'll know this song here, or maybe you don't. Are you familiar with it? We are 12 Just nod. But you're, for, for a bunch of handheld learning, it's obviously your hands. Maybe I should to wave or something. So, oh, isn't that sweet? So, you know the song. Katie Melo came out with this song, and she had what quite a lot of kids have. Uh, she had the formative assessment that isn't really. She got criticized for being wrong. And the thing with handheld learning technologies is you can often be considered wrong, using something in a wrong way. It's something I've noticed, something I've, I've felt as well. What Katie did with this song is actually went back and re-recorded it, and this is what she came up with. 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error bars and with the available information. I predict that I will always be with you. So, a beautiful song massacred by assessment. Which is why for me, the question of summative assessment, how does this fit in with examinations, frankly, leave it at the door because it has no place. This is all about the difference between the final products we come up with through our learning and the process. The important part here is process. If you talk about final product, final product, final product, which means good grades, you're going to get average mediocrity coming out. Fact. There'll be that lovely big hump of mediocrity in the middle with your top students down there and your bottom 20% at the other end and you'll throw loads of money at the bottom 20 and a little bit at the gifted and talented 2% and that big glorious hump in the middle will go off to college and do whatever they do. Process leads to ingenious. I like the difference that Stephen makes between ingenuity and creativity because my daughter's creative but she's 14 months old. It's hardly, you know, ingenious stuff she's coming up with yet. I give her, give her time. But what I wanted to point out is the, the process that you get in something like Watch the World from Robbie Dingo. I'm going to have to ask you to look it up um, on YouTube to look at it in full. Instead of doing an art project about a Van Gogh picture, he goes off and makes a 3D version of the Van Gogh picture in Second Life. So instead of going for the easy option, which is writing the essay and ripping off Wikipedia 
and maybe doing a little classroom talk on it, he goes to the trouble of engineering a 3D environment, which means you can go inside the painting and explore what's behind it. I'm sure you've seen that before, and if not, that's what YouTube's for. Fifth and final point, because I'm now one minute over and breaking the rule. The problem for education is quite acute, because this requires time and thinking. Thinking requires time. And it also requires a networked approach to learning. Participation culture doesn't work unless you're networked. This, these are my 481 best friends in Facebook. All the guys in the top left work in media. All these guys are former students who want to work in media. I know they're onto a good thing. What do you think everyone on the, left hand, on the right hand side does? They are all teachers, bar none. They talk to the person next to them. They don't appear to be interested in networking professionally, thinking and talking in ways that they don't think and talk in the classroom. And that's a heck of a challenge when you're trying to get people to consider any technology in a new networked way, because you have to be networked in the first place to do that. It's not a native immigrant thing. It's got nothing to do with those kids growing up with it and you not growing up with it, because all the technology we're actually talking about in this networked world has existed for the last three years. That's it. So that's not the argument for not doing it. I'm really passionate, as you may be told, that we move away from excuses like that and we move into getting network, getting involved, getting our hands dirty. It needs quality teachers who do research and development. If there's no time for it, we have to challenge that and make time for it. I was depressed that this morning was maybe a little bit too top down, depending on politicians and policymakers to do that for us. That's for teachers to do off their own bat. We need to improve instruction, and we need to deliver for every child. And that means not providing loads of equipment, which in itself is unsustainable, but using every gadget, gizmo, mobile phone, and gaming device that people happen to bring with them. Thank you very much.